Anyway, my name is Mitchell Rabin. I am a psychotherapist, acupuncturist, stress management consultant, and the host of a TV and radio show called A Better World. Do any of you watch it or listen? And if you don't, ah, yes, there we go. One, two, excellent. Go to abetterworld.net and tune in. I'm uh, on Gary Knoll's radio station, Progressive Radio Network, twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays at 6 p.m. It's a lot of fun. I interview such people as we have on our panel and many others about healing and nutrition and spirituality and consciousness and quantum physics and, you know, in short, saving the world. You know, little things like that, creating a better world. So, uh, today... We actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people, but uh, four are still in the invisible realm, three are visible. <laughs> You're gardening. <laughs> so, uh, but the gentlemen that we have here are wonderful. I've known them all, especially uh, the two of the farther ends, but Dr. Wallach's work I've known for many years uh, when I wanted to understand why dead doctors don't lie. And I think so highly of that work. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Of course, that's the only time they won't is when they're dead, right? <laughs> yes. And, of course, the reason why I no, say No, they're that, still lying. It's, it's just well, a different... A different farm, oh. yes. But um, the, the, average, uh, the average medical doctor lives to be 56, according to their own surveys and publications in medical journals, 56. And uh, they die from cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. And so why would you go if to any... If not suicide. If not, well, that's dentist. Well, yeah. more. I know. Yeah. And so, um, why would anybody go to a group of people whose average lifespan is 56 for advice on longevity? Why would anybody go to a group of people um, for how to avoid or cure cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke when that's what they die from? So, they're, they're not the go to people when it comes to those things. And the only people where the medical system really shines is in emergency surgery for car wrecks and military wounds and fourth degree burns and house fires and explosions. Removing bullets. Yeah, bullets. Yeah, and so your only hope in your prayer when you're going to the emergency room is that the medical doctor is sober and not on drugs when you get there. <laughs> According to Harvard Medical School and Lucien LePay, the head of the Department of Public Health, 52% uh, of medical doctors are intoxicated on um, alcohol or street drugs or prescription drugs. 52%? 52%. That's a three, three years ago, Lucien LePay came out with that. So you got to watch it. You do not want to oh. get sick. My. Oh, my. Stay healthy. Yeah. And that's why we're all gathered here today, because we are going to learn from these experts different ways, different interpretations on being healthy. How do create health if you're not at the level of health that you want, and how to increase health so that you're a shining example of human beingness, because that's really the game here. That's what it's really all about. And food is one part of it. I say that as a psychotherapist. Food is one part of it, but it's an important part of it, and that's what we're going to be focusing on here today. So on that note, uh, a gentleman who I met here uh, when I was moderating this panel a few years ago is named Chad Vandenberg. Chad, would you say hello? Well, hello. Um, I'm here tonight because I believe that yoga is union and that there are many paths to achieve that union and that what we put in our body has a dramatic, very, very powerful effect on our consciousness, our mind, our emotions, and our ability to live our highest potential in the world. I'm going to ask you to do one thing, each of you, is when you speak, if you would, please stand up because okay. we've had some people in the back who've had some trouble seeing and they want to get the full holistic picture. All right. Thanks, sir. All right. So, thank you very much. Yeah, give a little intro. Uh, well, basically, um, I, was in a, I was a gymnast and I was in a serious wreck. Um, I didn't think I was ever going to walk again. I had a bone spur sticking out of my leg and it cracked. You could hear it from 40 feet away. That led to a sedentary lifestyle where I thought I was re going to be relegated to a mere shadow of what it means to be a human. And that set in motion, you know, emotional uh, repercussions. I finally came to the point where said, give me liberty or give me death. I'm not here to live a shadow of my full potential. And so that brought me to the search of what choices are available. You know, you might not be able to choose who your parents were. You can't choose if somebody pulls out in front of you in the car. But you can choose what you put in your mouth. It's the one place when we're shifting our reality, the reflection the world gives back to us, our destiny. In fact, it's the one place where we have will 
we have choice. And we can say we don't have will when it comes to bread or chicken or ice cream, but that's simply a stage in the journey. And what I discovered is it can become easy. It can become very fast. And it opens up to a whole new world where a superhuman body, mind, and mood is inevitable. A superhuman body, mind, and mood, inevitable. And it gets right back down to the elements from all of the elements in the periodic table, 144 of them. And uh, I like to talk about the rarest ones. People aren't talking about ethereum, gold, scandium, and iodine. These are the things that create communication links in the protein and the genetic pathways of the human being. And this is why you can have only 3% difference in a fruit fly and a human being, and you get that much difference. 3% difference in the DNA of a fruit fly and a human being. What happens when you create the environment that automatically elicits your DNA's highest potential and you have a mere fraction of a percent shift in your own body? Miracles happen. Beautiful. Thank you, Chad. Lewis Harrison, would you please uh, stand up? and uh, give us a little introduction to your work in the domain of nutrition. Um, Hello? I'm hoping so. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, I'm a, a wealth and lifestyle coach, so I integrate the idea that if you're struggling and starving in your life, it's very hard to get good nutrition and think clearly. So uh, it integrates not just the emotional, spiritual, and physical, but also the economic. Can someone turn that mic up, please, Jeff? at all back there? For so my, my focus a lot when people work with me in coaching is they have to sort of deal with every aspect of their life and that's what my work is about. Um, just know about me a little bit, I have 12 books published. A lot of you know me over the years. Uh, I've done a lot of work with Jack Canfield who was in The Secret, wrote a book on depression, uh, a book on um, economics based on yoga principles. So the creation of wealth through yoga philosophy. And I have a retreat center upstate New York called the Harrison Center. It's a mansion up in Stanford, New York. Some of you might know that. Um, so that's my main work is wealth coaching. In, in terms of this work, no matter what program you're doing, it is my belief that you need to do a purification process. Could all radios be turned off plus cell phones? <laughs> so what happens in the work that I do is my belief that no matter what program you do, your body needs, your emotions and your mind need to have a period of shifting. You can't automatically change something instantly. And usually the cycles in nature are 30-day cycles. So uh, I don't have a particular, I'm a lacto-vegetarian myself, but I don't, I'm not talking here about any kind of diet in particular, but whatever diet you might want to go into, including raw food, I recommend 30-day. And one of the things that you need to do in a 30-day body purification, obviously I wrote a book called 30-Day Body Purification uh, about 15 years ago. And you have to clean your, your body, but also your home. So if you have toxic products inside of your home, then you can do a lot of purification, but then you're getting gases in and a lot of toxic products, producing chemicals that are gonna go into your system. So it's a two-part process. 30-day um, body purification, and like the TV show, 30-day home purification, you know, body purification, the home edition, uh, if you will. Um, you have to do both. And so the final thought simply is that um, I work from a Western and an Eastern approach. Five element theory, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic, as part of a 30-day program, Western body purification, and then you need to do a lot of cleaning of the liver and the kidneys and the lymphatic system. And the herb that I have found to be most useful that is, is Hawaiian noni. When I lived in Hawaii, we used to make our own noni um, vinegar. Uh, noni is pretty much the most powerful of all the cleansers. And if you use noni, uh, it should. And I, I represent the company. I'm letting you know there's a commercial that I do, but uh, it's not just for the money. It's actually I don't use Tahitian because most of the time it has guava or pineapple juice added to it. Uh, very often, I use 100% noni, non-preservatives, vacuum packed, and that's part of a 30-day program. Um, so that's basically what I do. When we're done, I have flyers here that just describe what the 30-day programs look like. Excellent. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you. Now uh, let's move to our latest panelist, Brenda Kahn.
Will you just uh, introduce yourself? If you mind, wouldn't mind stand up. Absolutely. So everybody can see your Thanks. pretty green uh, blouse. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I'm Brenda Cobb. I'm the founder of the Living Foods Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. We're in our 11th year now of helping people from all over the world. A lot of people from New York have come to see us. And uh, in February of 1999, I was diagnosed with breast and cervical cancer. And the doctors said I had to do surgery, chemo, and radiation, or I would be dead in six months to a year. And I didn't do any of those things because my mom and my aunts on both sides of the family had breast, cervical, uterine, or ovarian cancer. They did hysterectomies and mastectomies and chemo and radiation. And either the uh, treatments killed them or their cancers came back with a vengeance, and I knew that that would not heal. So that was the beginning of my journey and my quest. I found out about Dr. Ann Wigmore's work, and I got very busy with uh, her protocol. And um, from there, really expanded uh, a program now that really I have found will work no matter how ill a person may be, because a lot of people that we get at our center, uh, well, we get people that aren't sick, because they want to come and prevent getting sick, or they want to go to Optimum Health. But sometimes we get people that are really ill, that have been sent home to die or to hospice to die, where they've been told they're hopeless or terminal or incurable. I don't believe in the words hopeless, terminal, or incurable because I have thousands of people that are living testimonies to how everybody thought they were hopeless, terminal, and curable, and they are alive and well and better than they have ever been. Healing is much more than food. Number one thing people have to do to heal is they have to have correct thinking. If you are thinking incorrectly, no matter what else you are doing, you'll sabotage yourself. So how you think is more important than anything else. The number two most important thing in healing, still again, is not about food. Emotional healing. If you do not heal your emotional self, you may change your diet, you may cleanse, you may feel better. But we're not talking about just helping you feel a little better or even a lot better. We're talking about complete healing and, more importantly, staying well for a lifetime. Number three most important thing, stress. Everyone has got all this stress going on, but remember, it's never what happens to you in life that is important at all. It is your reaction to it. So we're going to help you to learn how to manage stress so it becomes a positive. Number four, toxic body. You've got to clean your body and detox the body. Getting out heavy metals, mercury and lead and many others and worms and parasites and fungus and mold and yeast and chemicals and additives and preservatives and over-the-counter and prescription drugs and on and on and on. Because if you just change what you eat but you don't clean out your body, you're putting good food on top of a bad situation. The nutrition that I have found to Optimum is... 80% raw and living foods, living being sprouted and growing, raw being raw vegetables, fruits that have not been cooked, and 20% cooked vegan. And that, I've found, has just been optimum for most everyone, although sometimes when people are in the beginning, they may need all raw and living foods for a time. And everyone is unique, so it's not a cookie-cutter approach. It is not a one-size-fits-all which is also, I think, important that you learn about you and get on a customized protocol that's really going to focus on helping you reach your goals. When you do all of those things, the body will do what God created it to do. It will heal itself. Stay focused on that and don't become a victim buying into any of the negative thinking about that. Instead, become empowered, learn, Learn what to do, and more importantly, do it. Because it's the doing it where you get the results. Beautiful. Thank you, Brenda. So interesting. You said t you eat 20% vegan. I mean... No, all vegan. All vegan? All vegan. Okay. All vegan, 80% raw and living, meaning not yes, cooked. Yes, okay. 20% vegan but cook vegan, so steamed vegetables, vegetable soup, baked yam, that kind of thing. I thought you meant you ate 20% vegans. Oh! My mistake, like, sorry. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> I got you. No, I have not eaten a vegan today. So, 
Because I'm not the... ruling it out, but I haven't eaten one. Okay. I just wanted to... Well, no, that would be an animal, and so I probably wouldn't really want to eat that, right? Because we are animals, I guess. I was just looking out for the audience, okay? <laughs> okay. Mitchell, it reminds me of an article I read. You know, you can An get old this... Jewish joke, right, Lewis? <laughs> you can read... I am old and I am Jewish, and it is the joke, yes. Um... <laughs> I remember reading an article because there's so many products you can get in a health food store now, like vegetarian hot dogs and stuff like that. It's an article about having uh, products that actually look like vegetables but are made from raw meat. So it'd be <laughs> carrots or potatoes or yams, but made from chicken or made from beef. It's not so. just tofu. Well, you know, there are as much there's as much junk food in health food stores as there are in regular grocery stores. So remember, I'm talking about fresh produce. I'm not talking about the boxes and the cans and the pasteurized and the bottles. I'm talking we about understand. that outer perimeter. Shop there. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Thank you. And Dr. Joel Wallach, who, aren't you a veterinarian? Yes, Among thank other you. things? Okay. Amongst other things. Okay, good. I just okay, wanted to be clear you. about what your credentials so everybody can listen appropriately. <laughs> Uh, You're a medical doctor and a veterinarian? Well, do I get to tell about myself? I'll yes, if you would please you give us an introduction yes. okay. for those people who weren't here early. Okay, yeah, I didn't thank hear you. That. Yeah. Shh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, the thing that makes my view different on health is that I have a degree in agriculture. My major was in animal husbandry and nutrition. And in the animal industry, we've eliminated 900 different diseases in the livestock industry not with stem cells or genetically engineered proteins or with wonder drugs or organ transplants, but by simply putting vitamins and minerals in animals' food. Again, for those who just came in later, uh, we have um, leveled the playing field in animals. Let's just take the classroom guinea pig, for instance. All you know, little fourth graders have a guinea pig or a rabbit, at least we used to. And um, uh, they get little alfalfa pellets, but they're not alfalfa pellets. The alfalfa pellet is just the carrier for all the vitamins and minerals and amino acids, all the essential nutrients uh, that those guinea pigs need. And if they eat Ralston Purina guinea pig pellets, laboratory guinea pig pellets, every guinea pig who eats those will live to be 12 years of age with no disease. If they're left to their de own devices eating things locally, none of them will live to be 12, most of them will live to be 3 to 5 because of this variation, this high variation of nutrients in the food. And so we level the playing field in laboratory animals and livestock by actually putting all known essential nutrients in them. And often, as a kid, I wondered why we did that for animals and not people. And then my minor was in field crops and soils, where I learned about plant nutrition and soil nutrition and how it affected animals and people. I then went to veterinary school and uh, not only got my veterinary degree, but I got a postdoctoral fellowship in comparative pathology and actually I did 20,000 autopsies plus uh, 17,500 uh, zoo animals that lived uh, in various zoos around the country. They died from natural causes. And uh, 3,000 human beings who lived in close proximity to the zoos. And the purpose was to, in the mid-60s, to try and find out uh, if pollution had anything to do with the cause of the diseases they died from. And what I learned was that every animal, every human being who died of natural causes died of a, nut a nutritional deficiency disease. Wrote, 77 certified um, peer-reviewed papers are in medical journals, veterinary journals, international pathology journals. The book that came out of that is actually in the Smithsonian Institute. It's one of these big things that's, you know, uh, weighs 25 pounds. Uh, it's in the Smithsonian Institute. It's not anything you would curl up with. Uh, it has uh, the 20,000 autopsies in there and all the 10 million chemistries and so forth. And um, I tried for many years speaking at medical uh, continuing education events uh, trying to get doctors interested in using nutrition to prevent and cure diseases in people like they did in animals. As I was an abysmal failure uh, doing that. I never could get medical doctors interested. So I went back to school and became a physician, okay, a naturopathic physician in the West Coast in Oregon where I went to school and practiced for 12 years. Uh, we're primary care physicians. We can do anything that a medical doctor does out in the West Coast. Out here, um, the medical lobby is too powerful and you can't get that done here, not in our lifetimes probably, and certainly not that now that the IRS is controlling the medical system, so the, the odds are that won't happen. But out in the West Coast, naturopathic physicians who graduate from accredited schools are primary care physicians. Um, so I went back to school, became a physician, and very quickly um, I was dealing with literally thousands of people a day 
who heard that I could get rid of arthritis and get rid of diabetes, get people off of, of uh, dialysis. Um, even if they've had um, cartilage and meniscus surgically removed, we could rebuild it because surgeons are very sloppy and they always leave uh, some stem cells in there. All you got to do is give the right nutrition, the body will rebuild itself. And so uh, out of that came about 12 books that were written for the public. The most popular one, I guess, is Dead Doctors Don't Lie. Sold over 10 million of the books and 108 million of the uh, CDs, originally an audio cassette tape. The most recent one is Immortality. We're talking about physical immortality. We all have the capacity to live well beyond 140. People live beyond 120 all the time. And uh, my wife and I uh, spent 10 years digging up all the common threads. And the people who um, live to be well beyond 100 chronologically, well, being biologically 30, 40, 50, 60, do certain things. There, there are common threads amongst all these top 20 longevity cultures. Number one, they don't have access to medical care. <laughs> they're, all, they're all third world cultures. They're all third world cultures. None of them are first world industrialized nation. Mm -hmm. um, they all have 25 times, which you mentioned earlier, 25 times the antioxidants we do in terms of auric points. They all get them from different sources. In Okinawa, it's sweet potatoes and Sardinia, it's red wine, and Costa Rica is dark chocolate, and so on. So they all have different sources, but when you look at it chemically as auric points, they all have 25,000 auric points or more. And then they all are still third world cultures in the fact that they don't have electricity and natural gas and propane. They still use wood as universal fuel. This is one of their many saving graces. Uh, many of the byproducts of using wood for fuel include wood ashes, which are not carbon, they're actually minerals that are left when you burn away the carbon in the wood, and they put these minerals, these wood ashes, into the gardens, the plant takes them up, they eat the plants, and they actually get minerals in that fashion. So they get a uniform condition of these minerals, they level the playing field just like we do for guinea pigs with those little alfalfa pellets. In the industrialized world, you don't know what you're getting in your food. We are not putting wood ashes back into our gardens like we did in the days of our grandparents. So with that, that's my introduction, and of course I started a company uh, called Youngevity. Uh, which has a thousand products in it and they're designed for vegans. We have a lot of vegans, we have whole foodists, we have uh, vegetarians of every kind. Uh, myself, I'm an omnivore. Um, if it lives, I eat it. And so that's where I come from. So the nice thing is that I'm an omnivore. I usually kill it first. <laughs> There's some who don't, so I'm glad to hear you're on that side of the fence. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wallach. Wow, we so interesting. So what we see is a real interesting, there's some confluence and there's some divergence in the panelists here. Everyone has their own, what you can gather from their original uh, output is some uh, overlap and some distinction in the way they look. Quite honestly, what I would like to do right now is, at least for a little bit, is open up the uh, floor for some questions so we can have each one respond from their place what they have to say to you. This young, beautiful woman here. And just speak up loud. Okay. I have a question for someone who is... No, everybody's going to answer. Oh, okay. Um, my question is about pregnancy and um, breastfeeding. Maybe you have questions. In other words, what is a possible protocol yeah. for a woman who is pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant? Yeah. Okay? Not yes, indeed. In Very good. Thanks so much. Will you start, Brendan? Uh, yeah, I'll be happy to answer that. I have had a lot of pregnant women come. I've also had many couples come who have been infertile and trying to get pregnant, sometimes for 12, 15, or even more years. It's so much fun to try to get pregnant, isn't it? I guess so, uh, but they couldn't do it. You know, it wasn't as much fun for them since they weren't accomplishing yeah. it. And then once they came and went through this whole protocol, um, they got pregnant actually very soon, you know, after that. But many people find out they're pregnant and now they're concerned of what to do about the baby. We do have a protocol for pregnant women to be able to do gentle cleansing and detoxification and remembering now that everyone is unique and it's not the cookie cutter approach. So I, I normally have consultations and talk to the person about what is all going on with them. And that there is gentle cleansing. Remembering too that if you will go ahead and do that, 
You're giving the baby a better environment for it to be able to grow and develop. Sometimes people wait until they've had the baby, and then they want to do a detox, and they're cleansing. And then, you know, things are coming out, you know, from the milk and so forth. So that's another type of an issue that you have to um, work with an individual on and how to do and what to do, if anything, during that particular time. And there are some gentle ways to do that as well. I do encourage breastfeeding, but did you guys know that um, scientific research now says that in 99% of women, with well, of mother's milk, that it has got DDT in there? So there's a lot of chemicals in there. So I do think that you're smart if you're pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant to be able to not only cleanse, but really use nutrients, good nutrients to build your body up and give your baby a really good start. I, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, focalize this a little bit more and, and I would like you to speak for just another minute or so. Because okay. she knows and people know that they need to detoxify. They know the need to cleanse. So it's not that as the question, but what specifically, knowing that we're all biospecific, what in general would you say to her about her cleansing? Well, again, remember you can't be general since everyone is but unique. You have to be a little general okay, so, now. All right, so a little general little now. General. Start out with a small amount of wheatgrass juice. A half ounce or an ounce if you've not done it before, okay? Yes, okay. Uh, there is a recipe in my Living Foods Lifestyle book called Energy Soup, which is not cooked, but it's a blended smoothie. It has greens. It has some sea vegetables for mineralization. It's got some avocado. It's got some essential fatty acids, some omega-3s, etc. So that would be something easy. You can blend it into a smoothie and drink it. There's a recipe in here called for something called veggie kraut, which is a fermented cabbage, like a sauerkraut. And it has a lot of nutrient density and some good probiotics. Because we, you know, our, in our gut we make B12, but we can't make it if we don't have enough of the friendly, the good probiotics. I do recommend that vegans take a sublingual B12 every day to be on the safe side, however. But if you have enough of that friendly probiotic, you're going to start making that B12 as well. And those three things right there, eating more of, of your greens and your salads and things, some green juices can help, and that can begin a detox. Now, I don't recommend fasting or just doing juicing because it can be too quick. And I believe that, especially in a case like this, a slower, more steady detox is safer. Beautiful. Thank you, Brenda. Chad, would you? Yeah. Um, well, mind standing just absolutely. So, um, I really appreciate your question. Um, my m one of my backgrounds is basically I, I was part of a, a rebirthing crew where we worked with people who were going through psychological trauma at one point in my life, and it's very interesting. At a certain point in the process, when they made the breakthrough to their birth, literally, they would begin to smell like the toxins that were in their body, and this is something that I didn't quite understand at the time, but I see how important it is to cleanse. And so for me, when I think about cleansing, because we're all humans, whether we're pregnant or not, um, what's good for the baby is of utmost importance. And we don't, we want to get cleansed, but we don't want to flood the baby with the detox symptoms, right? So how do you get the toxins out without poisoning the bloodstream at the same time is essentially the question. And there is, um, in nature, an animal, a, ve a vegetarian animal, whenever they have a toxic dose, they will eat clay. And that clay binds the toxins and pulls them out of the body without giving the, the suffering. And so what we have now, the next level of that evolutionary um, impulse to eat clay, uh, what, you know, they talk about pregnant mothers trying to eat dirt and <laughs> pica, see? Now, that's the body's intelligence seeking to latch onto there and you know, bring things out that don't need there. So now we have something called zeolites. And zeolites are an electrical charge, microscopic volcanic mineral that actually sucks toxins into it so that it won't hurt your nervous system or your body tissues on the way out. And so uh, zeolites are expensive. If you want to go with a, a less expensive route, you can get like clays at certain health food stores or online, Mount Rillianite clays. Um, but I think they're very important. I do have some zeolites, and you can get on my email list, and I'll have some tomorrow at the talk. So, Beautiful. Great, Chad. Thanks so much.
Dr. Wallach, yes, sir. and I'm looking for, you know, succinct uh, specificity. We were talking in generalities, now we're specific. Specific generalities. Yeah. Okay, okay. I just want to know what track I'm on here. Okay. okay. General specifics. <laughs> I'm going to start out by saying I've gotten more women pregnant than any other man in history. <laughs> Could you explain yeah, specifically? Probably, probably, probably about 100,000 a year, okay? And it's through nutrition. Usually women who are infertile uh, are infertile because of pregnancy issues. Of course, this goes back to the livestock industry. And uh, while dealing with infertility in livestock, we also eliminated all birth defects. That's a very profound statement. We've eliminated all birth defects in animals. Can you imagine somebody paying a $10 million stud fee for a triple crown winner and they have a, a full barn with Down syndrome or cleft palate or spina bifida. And so by giving optimal amounts of nutrition, this includes the 90 essential nutrients, including the 60 minerals, for three months before conception, there's never been a full barn under those circumstances with any birth defects. So the $10 million is a good bet. Uh, we lead people to their own devices, hoping and praying there is nutrition in the food, right? And we wind up with all these birth defects. It's absolutely criminal for a human baby in America to be born with a birth defect. And so for the detoxing part, I don't like to wake up things that are in a mother. It's kind of late at that point. So what I like to do is give them the 90 essential nutrients. And selenium, for instance, which is one of the essential minerals, will actually neutralize the toxic effects of mercury. Um, Calcium will neutra, uh, neutralize the toxic effects of lead. And so pregnant women, above all, need more nutrition per pound of body weight than people who are not pregnant, right? Because they're, they're essentially eating biochemically for two. And on that subject, um, pica, which is discussed here, is in animals is called cribbing. And cribbing, how many of you have heard of cribbing in animals? Or, okay, well, pica in animals. The term pica is for kids and pregnant women. They're legendary when they crave weird things in the middle of the night and want to eat clay and wood ashes and things like this. They're <laughs> minerally deficient. It's a mineral deficiency that drives them to do that. That same mineral deficiency that drives them to eat weird things during pregnancy also causes them to eat weird things when they're not pregnant and causes them to gain weight. And so people who can't lose their baby fat is because they're minerally deficient. They eat, 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 nibble, nibble, nibble because they're minerally deficient. They take the 90 essential nutrients with a focus on the 60 essential minerals They'll lose their baby fat. They're more likely to have normal babies. And they'll make plenty of good milk. One little caveat here, you are what you absorb. You are not, are not what you eat. Right now, there, there's uh, anywhere from three to five people with celiac disease out of every 10, 30 to 50%. And so when you have babies that are born with eczema and asthma, it's because the mother has celiac disease. Do not give that milk to the Le Leachy League or anybody else when your baby has distress from the mother's milk because you'll be giving other people the problem, okay? Because you sensitize the baby through the breast milk. So if the mother has illnesses, they're not genetic, but they will sensitize the baby. If you have eczema, dermatitis, if you have asthma, you do not want to be breastfeeding your baby because you'll pass it on through the milk to them by giving them gluten intolerance. Very interesting, okay. Thank you, Dr. Wallach. Thanks. Lewis. Um, over the last couple of years, there have been newspaper articles about people who are raw foodists with really good intentions, who are calorically deficient, and their babies and their children suffered. So going away from the raw food aspect and more on traditional mainstream nutrition, which you have covered a bit, it's important that, um, that a pregnant woman go organic if possible. And so if they're vegan, just having an organic diet of fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and grains, itself is going to have a cleansing effect in the system. And it's important that they be sure that the caloric content is high enough since a lot of people who go on raw foods, if they're pregnant and they don't have that distinction between a pre-pregnant and post or during pregnancy diet, they can be running low in calories, which is neither connected to whether it's whole foods, raw food, or junk food, they're just cal calorically deficient. So if someone's living on a really perfect raw food diet and they're getting 1,000 calories a day or 1,200 calories a day, they're going to hurt their baby. And so I think the key is, um, you, spoke, you actually struck me because you talk about so many essential nutrients, but in, in more within the groupings, you have proteins, fats, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, and water. And a person needs to be sure that they're getting the recommended, I don't mean the federal government recommended, but 
high enough levels of proteins, fats, carbohydrates, vitamin, mineral, and water. And certainly you can get that from a raw food, vegan diet, but you must get it. So it was important what you talked about, it's the sublingual vitamin B12. And if people are gonna use protein, they need to make sure that they're getting uh, the essential nutrients, all the essential amino acids. Uh, very often, I have a school of alternative medicine, and um, not degrading any school, uh, I'll talk to people who, they, they went to some school and they studied holistic nutrition. And uh, I know they have a certification as a holistic nutritionist. And they know macrobiotics, and they know raw foodism, and they know uh, Dr. Atkin, and I say, what are the five essential nutrients? And they go, uh, uh, I don't know. So you can know a whole lot about theory, especially radical nutrition theory, and not know a single thing about basic fundamental nutritional biochemistry. And that's sad and it's also dangerous. So I think it's really important just to repeat that, that if a person is pregnant, they can do tremendous detoxification in a positive way by using whole foods. 80-20 um, is wonderful on the raw to, to cook, organically grown. Um, and also make sure that they're getting enough calories so that they don't hurt the child from uh, nutritional deficiencies tied to depleted calories. And Wonderful. that's my thoughts on that. Good, Lewis. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Wallach is going to speak, and then I'm going to share a little bit myself. Okay. Yeah, this is just very brief, but I just want to, again, make a, a plea. If you're going to do a vegan diet, whether you're a guy and not pregnant, a girl not pregnant, or a pregnant girl, <laughs> um, um, you can flourish as a vegan, whether you're eating raw food or semi-cooked or whatever, you can flourish, but there is the caveat, again, plants cannot manufacture minerals like they can carbon compounds. And so you want to hedge your bet by supplementing with the 90 essential nutrients, particularly focusing on minerals. And remember, so many of the birth defects are caused by mineral deficiencies in early pregnancy. Don't wait until you're three months into the pregnancy to start thinking about supplementation. You want to fertilize the field, so to speak, long before conception occurs. And so you want to be extremely careful if you're going to be a vegan, you want to supplement because veganism today is not like it was 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago because plants do not manufacture minerals. Soil is deficient. Nutritional minerals occur in veins in the soil, not a, a continuous blanket. And it's kind of like chocolate and chocolate ripple ice cream. So you may luck out and get some, you may not. And so uh, you can't say that uh, you can eat a vegan diet and get everything you need. That is not true. You can flourish, but you must supplement. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I want to uh, say that uh, I want to expand our understanding of nutrition as going far beyond the idea of food and water. And nutrition is really another way of saying nourishment, a form of nourishment. And we nourish each other all the time in our social relationships. And when it comes to prenatal care, it is vitally important, from my view, in the field of psychology and total biology, that you be very conscious of the thoughts going through your mind and the communications you make to your baby and to your spouse. That is information that is a form of nutrition and it could be toxic nutrition if those thoughts and feelings that you're feeling, questions you're having, doubts you might be having, are not looked at, cleaned up, and let go of. So you can feed the baby, the fetus, the proper amount of love and understanding. Because that is a communication that's happening all day long. If you think about the time that you're eating or drinking water, it's actually very little throughout the entire day but you are communicating all the time. And that, I want to submit, is a form of nutrition and nourishment that cannot be overlooked. Okay. So, thank you all for everything you're saying. Uh, yes, that persistent gentleman there. Yes, uh, before, I, before I introduce him, I wanted to know what the panel thinks regarding extracting versus emulsifying. Um, I think that Okay, did everybody get that question? No. Uh, regarding juicing, he wants to know what's the difference between extracting and emulsifying. So, oh, how do they feel? Which is the preferred? What is the more beneficial? Right, exactly. Brenda, can we go this way again? Yeah, sure. Um, when you are blending, you're getting all the fiber as well as you're getting the juice. And 
You know, like the pectin that's in apples will bind to radioactive particles in the body and pull it out. And fiber can really help to pull things out of the body too. And so many times I like to start with people first in doing blending and with getting all of the fiber. And then sometimes later adding the juices. Sometimes juice fasting with green juices, for instance, can be beneficial. And I think they both have their place depending on what the person is wanting to achieve. But the blending, sometimes people will say, well, when you're blending it, though, you're oxidizing it. And when you're blending it really quickly in some of these very high speed, like Vitamix has one, and, you know, these high speed blenders, it only just takes a moment. When it gets broken down into those smallest particles possible, it really is much better for the body to digest. And you've got to digest You've got to assimilate, you've got to absorb, and you've got to eliminate. And because the digestive issues with so many people are way out of balance, it has led to many diseases. So I believe I like blending, okay, in those beginning cases, and especially like for that first 10 or 12 days, and then going to some juicing, and I really do also think it's got to be specific juices because so many people have been told to drink lots of, say, carrot juice, but because it's very high in sugar, for some that sugar is actually feeding a problem, whereas the green juice, maybe with a little bit of the carrot juice, okay, in there, it can be much more beneficial as those greens are cleansing and they're also nourishing too. So I think both can be appropriate, but I do love the blending. Thank you. Yeah, so I think it depends really on what your objective is. If your objective is to just clean out a little bit and get all your nutrition, you're going to get more nutrition with the fiber in there. So that's awesome. I make salad smoothies all the time. They're thick. They're like ice cream. They're like so good. And I feel you get more nutrition. The juicing is great for really cleaning out, moving on to water fasting as a, as a transition. But they're both missing something. And that is that each tooth is literally a, a part of an energy circuit that travels through your organs. And the teeth are piezoelectric. That means pressure creates a charge. And then when you press your teeth together, you actually are taking information from the food and it's putting it through. And all the organs that line up with those particular nutrients are getting information, preparing them for the nutrients that are going to come. And so when we're not using our teeth, we're actually allowing our organs to become lazy and basically they only live a half lifetime and um, it's been shown humans have a lifespan of literally unlimited thousands of years a human being can live and i've watched i've looked at all these different cases I've found several cases over 200 several cases over 300 years and something they all had in common and i divided mathematically an average between 97.5 and 120 years something very strange happens to the human organism that is that if it lost all its hair or its teeth they all regrow just like we have a set of baby teeth and they regrow we all have a certain age puberty hits well our life style eating all this stuff that we've been programmed to accept as normal creates an effect where like those lab rats that, that were there, they died at like three years when they give them the wrong nutrients. Well, our teeth are so important that our body is a built-in program that if we provide the right conditions and if we live long enough to get to the place where we actually hit that spot, then we get a new set of teeth. That's how important they are. And so we, we must use them if we want to maintain this physical vehicle as, as an immortal. Whoa, we heavy. <laughs> you know, fabulous, fabulous. You know, a uh, little piece of information uh, is that I came across this many years ago when I was in the flotation tank business. The National Institute of Aging did some studies, this is back in the, in the 70s, that said when cells are properly hydrated, they don't die. So that makes a case for the immortality subject here that I'm so very fond of. So they don't die. So when we're really breathing and drinking and hydrating, you know, we can go on for maybe forever. On that note, Dr. Wow. Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on the subject of juicing, the human being is a juice machine. By the time you put food in your mouth and chew it up, add saliva to it, stomach juices, uh, small intestine, all the enzyme, the whole goal is to get everything you eat down into juice so you can absorb it. So we are a, a juice machine. 
I was very blessed to work with in uh, uh, the last oh, 10 years, uh, Jay Cordish, the juice man. Have you ever heard of Jay Cordish? Uh, he and I spent uh, literally weeks uh, in the um, studio putting together a set of CDs called The Juice Cures and got his 50 years of wisdom by, it was kind of an interview, I was interviewing him and getting his um, years of wisdom uh, on juicing into this Juice Cure CD set. And again, you can come down to booth 206 and we'll take orders for him. We're kind of sold out already here, but we can take orders for him. And basically, um, I like, uh, like Jay did, the extractors. You're getting the juice without the fiber for the most part because fiber has phytates and it binds onto nutrients so you can't absorb the nutrients. The nutrients will be bounded by a phytate um, which is found in raw foods, so you have to watch it. And I like people who eat a percentage raw and a percentage steamed because when you have things that snap, like raw carrots and raw broccoli and celery, they have lots of phytates in them, but when you steam them and they don't snap when you bend them, the phytates have been broken down and they're rendered harmless. So you have to be aware of that. If you're going to juice, you want to add the certified organic plant minerals, 77 minerals in there. That way you're guaranteeing that that juice is going to have all the minerals. Remember, the juice has carbon compounds in there, vitamins, amino acids, uh, maybe some fatty acids, but you don't know about the minerals because plants don't make them. They only pick up what might be in the soil, where they're growing in a vein of nutrients. Uh, does that vein of, of minerals have three minerals in it or 18? You don't know. And so the only way to guarantee it is put an a, um, ounce of the plant mineral certified organic into each eight ounces of the juice you make. And in this system, uh, the Juice Cures uh, uh, CD set, uh, Jay gives his best juice combinations for each disease. It's kind of a nice little set. His 50 years of wisdom on that set. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. Don't hold back, please. <laughs> this, is, this is not a commercial for my book. However. However. However, however. <laughs> the 30 day body purification, how to cleanse your inner body and experience the joys of toxin free health. The coincidence we implanted that 70 pages on juicing in a 300 page book. Um, there's a section called Home Doctoring with Juices. And one of the things about healing, which is always complex in our community, is that you really want to deal with the system holistically emotional, biochemical, structural, and spiritual. And you don't want to focus on symptoms. And also some people just feel like crap because their head hurt or, or their, their back hurts or whatever's going on, they have some symptoms. And so one of the things that juices can do because of the intense content of nutrients, uh, minerals and vitamins and enzymes, is they can allay some symptoms that show up for people when they're in the cleansing process. And so a lot of what the 70 pages is composed of is if you have this particular problem, then this combination of juices will allay some of those kind of symptoms. And those, sim those symptomatic uh, approaches to holistic healing are not the best way to go. If a person feels bad enough, they will very often abandon a program if they're not totally committed to the program. So if you can reduce some of the discomfort or some of the symptoms while they're on a cleansing program, I think it's a productive and a good thing. And so in that sense, you're using juices as a, as a therapeutic tool, and certain juices uh, have higher levels of certain nutrients than other juices do. And in that sense, you start getting into formulas, which Jay Cordish actually did a lot with, and also Dr. Jensen did a lot with that also. You know, remember our pioneers, we forget them too quickly, Dr. Christopher, Dr. Jensen, Herbert Shelton, and some of the early natural hygiene people. Mm -hmm. um, when I started studying this stuff in the mid 60s, um, feeling old. Um, <laughs> so I think that if a person has a physical problem, they're looking to do cleansing and they're looking to heal, I think uh, juicing is an incredibly powerful therapeutic tool to use along with supplementation. But the question was extraction or emulsification? Well, emulsification is a wonderful thing, but you're not going to have the same concentration of nutrients if you're using it for therapeutic purposes. So on a daily basis, emulsification is wonderful. You get a, a great, uh, and also you get more oxidation, by the way, because you have more heat 
that's being produced in an emulsification situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're going to have destruction of certain nutrients from emulsion. There's a someone sending a product downstairs, which I'm not promoting. The product is a great product. If you blend it fast enough, it'll get hot. And if it gets hot, well, forget about your theory about raw foods at that point. You're destroying enzymes, you're well, destroying nutrients in the hot. heat. It depends on how Yeah, so I think the spinning of blades and emulsification, I'm sure, that does reduce some nutrients in some ways. So I don't think there's an absolute answer you can give. If, if you're doing therapeutic purposes, I think juicing is the stronger way to go. That's right. If you're going for general nutrition, emulsification is fine. Got it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So... Uh, just to let you all know that uh, this panel will be available on CD uh, one floor up afterward at Jeff Gold's booth there. So if you need to hear more, or you need to hear it again, it is available for, you know, a couple of... I have flyers for people who want to take them. Exactly. Well, we're not finished just yet. We still have a ways to go. So, hey, 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 we're not finished. Did the radio get turned off back there, by the way? I, hope the radio doesn't turn off. I haven't heard any cell phones or other radios. Okay, good. So, uh, do you want to stand up and stretch for a moment? Because we're in for the long haul. We've got another half hour. Want to stretch? Want to breathe? And then, all right, that's enough. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> This is a little station identification. <laughs> and uh, we're only, only going to take 30 seconds because we've got a lot more to cover. No, 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 not now. Uh-uh, uh-uh. This is a 30-second thing. We're back in our seats with our seat belts on. Okay. This is called a sorting out process between the people who are really committed to their health and well-being and everybody else. All right, great. Okay, so uh, we are now opening the field to another question. Yes, this young lady right here. That got answered already. No. Yeah. Sure it did. Yeah. Yes, it did. Yeah. Do you want to give a quick? Uh, the question is: Do the panelists uh, recommend someone who's pregnant be a hundred percent raw? Sure. You want to give a quickie? Yes, no, yes, no. You know, I found honestly eighty percent raw living, twenty percent cooked vegan. You know, uh, first of all, people stay with it longer. Um, you know, people that are just going all 100% raw and living foods sometimes don't stay with it or even feel like that there's something wrong with eating something cooked, and that's not the case. And some people can actually even have more than that. The percentages can be different. You know, some people are 50-50. Some people are 30-70. You know, there are different things, and again, depending on severity of the issue and what is going on, but... An 80-20, I have found, seems to really work extremely well for most people in the long run. I say theoretically 100%. Are the animals 80-20? No. What are we biologically? Did we come built with pretty little stoves? No. However, there's the very real fact we all live in a world we've already taken on, a cultural heritage, and sometimes our bodies don't want to switch over right away. So if you're not already 100% raw, you definitely want a coach and somebody with you, you know, guiding you towards that, and there's no right or wrong, but don't feel like you have to. But uh, theoretically, biologically, why wouldn't we want to have all of the nutrients in their perfect, pristine state? There may be reasons. Okay. There may be reasons that cooking is good, and we know that cooking does liberate some nutrients that are not available when not cooked. Like That's piece, number one. Yeah. Number two... I was just thinking about the element of fire and how valuable it is, and that humans can harness it and animals actually can't. Maybe that's why they don't cook food. Habanero peppers. Wait a minute. Hold it. And three, we don't grow fur like polar bears. So maybe there's a good reason to have fire and even cooked food and, you know, fat when we live in the northern climes. 
These are questions, not answers, but I wanted to bring them up. You're taking the gloves off now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. That was fiery, okay. wasn't it? To Dr. answer Wallen. to her question, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you go 100% raw or not, but there are certain basic principles that go along with that. Number one, a pregnant woman needs 120 grams of protein. Not 120 grams of nuts, but 120 grams of protein. Eskimos eat their meat raw. They don't cook it, okay? Um, they, um, and also... Certainly they're need, fat. Yeah, you need fat. You need a minimum of 30 to 60% of your calories from good fats. You need 3% of your calories from omega-3 essential fatty acids. And you need, this, you know, 60 essential minerals that so need some supplementation there. And so pregnant woman has a huge responsibility. You can't just eat raw and not supplement. You cannot eat raw and not measure out how many grams of protein you're taking in, how many grams of fat you're taking in, how many grams of, of the omega-3s. Otherwise, you wind up with trouble. You might as well, as soon as the baby's born, put him in jail because he's going to be violent and he's going to have autism and all this stuff and birth defects if you don't do the other part. So you can go 100% raw because there are cultures who eat everything raw. So we don't have to do that experiment. It's already done. But the thing that makes them successful is they're putting wood ashes into their food. Now, you can't put wood ashes in your food because you don't live off of fire in your house, right? And so you have to come down to 206 and get our minerals and put them in your food. <laughs> and, pick up, and pick up a little wood ash while you're at it. I actually have wood ash in my house, but that's a different conversation. Something we haven't really talked about is um, Eastern approaches to nutrition, the idea of the five elements, ether, air, fire, water, and earth. And so one of the things that humans are able well, to do is... that's the Vedic system. Within the Vedic system, yeah. Vedic. Vedic. Indian. The Vedic Indian. system. Well, Chinese. Can go, I'm Native American and African okay. and Latin American and shamanic. I miss anything? Yes. It, that's oh, not dream, the Chinese. That's dream, all dream time. Uh, uh, but, but, okay, so. Okay. No, no, the, please go on. The nonlinear nutritional approaches. <laughs> so what happens is when you, uh, uh, those who are Reiki masters, those who do polarity therapy or energy healing, there's the concept of transmutation of energy into different forms. And so in that case, you're dealing with things like foods that are fiery, airy, or watery, or earthy. And uh, in that sense, you're not speaking in terms just about enzymes or what's a raw food or what's a cultural idiosyncrasy, but more about the transmutation um, through different qualities. And in that construct, uh, some people are very, very fiery and they need more earthy food. Other people are very, wa very watery, they need more airy food. And so in that sense, it doesn't really matter if you're using raw food or using juices or emulsified. It really is the elements that are involved um, that you're dealing with. And that's a whole other brain and mindset that you're working with than traditional Western approaches to nutrition. So um, keep that in mind for those of you that have an interest in energy medicine or wearing pyramids on your head or special you know, things to protect your cell phone from, that you're dealing in the realm of energy medicine and the, the whole mental, emotional, and psychological structure of how energy medicine works is very different than the kind of stuff that we're talking about. And you certainly do need to use um, a certain minimum number of calories and the essential nutrients, but after that, you're really just transmuting it at that point. But I think the key point to finish, what I want to say, um, which we had covered before and just repeat again, if you're getting the essential nutrients, you can, get a, you can eat termites, uh, uh, if you're getting proteins, fats, I mean, I happen to be a lacto-vegetarian, but, you know, if you're a Maasai tribesman, no dis well, I guess that is raw, isn't it? Yep, you can be drink. Milk. you know, you, you drink, you know, you're drinking milk and blood. and blood, and that's what Maasai tribesmen do. And these guys, you know, they're six feet three, you know, they, they, could, they could run marathons, and they're out in the Kalahari Desert living on, with their cows, with milk, termites, and blood. And it's sort of a raw food diet, I guess, unless they cook the termites, I guess. Nope. So, uh, nope, they're raw. It's a raw food diet. Blood, <laughs> milk, termites. And uh, Are you suggesting that we eat termites? Well, since you're going to open this door, I'm going to say this. Anybody here raised Jewish? I was raised Jewish. So I used to eat this thing called Stuff Derma when I was a kid, which I thought was really cool. And then when I was 25, what I found that it was stuffed cow's intestines. So I think if you're going to eat stuffed cow's intestines, termites ain't a whole lot worse. 
And a lot of us have cultural idiosyncrasies that are almost ethnocentrically racist in a way that I wouldn't mind eating like a dead chicken, but I'd never eat a termite. Um, and so I think that um, there's so, it's such a rich soup of cultural idiosyncrasies, westernization, <laughs> having juicers. Masai tries me very hard plugging that juicer into the desert. Um, so the work the best that you can with what you got. Right. And, um, and I think that you have to sort of balance, but at the end of the day, to get to the core question, you can be 100% pure vegan and raise a healthy child and have a healthy pregnancy if you're getting enough calories, enough proteins, fats, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, and water. And that's basic nutritional biochemistry, which we should not ignore just because we're holistic. Fabulous. We're paying the price. Good answer. Thank you, Lewis. Answer. Thank you. So in other words, except for unless you're a Maasai, termites might be terminal. <laughs> See the only one who got it? Oh no, you all did. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, next question. Please. <laughs> <laughs> next question. Yes, young lady. I want to know if you can use the hyperthyroid. Can that be directed without surgery? Yes. Yes. Did everybody get yes. the question? Hyperparathyroid. Uh, Hyperparathyroid, does it require surgery or are there alternative treatments? Yes, uh, you wanna start? Go okay, ahead. let me start on this one. Sure. Um, if you read through my papers, I've probably written 25 major papers on that particular subject, okay? It's in all of my books. It's a very common problem and when you have hyperparathyroidism, the parathyroid glands, which are supposed to be the size of a lentil, get the size of a grape, First thing the medical system wants to do is surgically remove them, right? Anything big, take it off. And um, basically when you have hyperparathyroidism is that uh, you have a raging osteoporosis. Oftentimes your blood calcium will be 14 milligrams per deciliter instead of 8.5 to 10.5. Doctors freak out uh, that their calcium is that high. That's because your parathyroid glands are, are uh, releasing a hormone called parathormone, which pulls all the calcium out of your blood and you get a hypercalcemia because of raging osteoporosis. So the alternative to, and the only true treatment for hyperparathyroidism, in fact, the name really should be secondary nutritional hyperparathyroidism. In 99% of the cases, there, there's no known tumors or cancers of the parathyroid gland. Thyroid gland, yes, but not parathyroid gland. And so you want to supplement with um, all the known essential nutrients with a special emphasis on vitamin D3 and calcium. You want to take in about 2,500 milligrams of a usable calcium. That's the amount of calcium, not the amount of calcium carbonate, but the actual amount of available calcium. And to that, we actually have a liquid calcium called OsteoFX Plus, which has 79 other nutrients that are necessary for proper utilization of calcium. It tastes like pina colada. And if you know of anybody with hyperparathyroidism or hypercalcemia, get them on that. Two or three days, it's gone. What does hyperparathyroidism do? Well, okay. Well, when you go in for when you go in for a physical examination, the doctor takes a blood sample and he sees your blood calcium is 14 instead of eight and a half to ten and a half. He freaks out, so they do radio um, uh, isotope examination of your parathyroids, or he does an ultrasound. They see your parathyroids are big. So he says, How are you affected, you know? okay, it's going to accelerate osteoporosis and fractures because you already have osteoporosis when you have par secondary hyperparathyroidism is a result of osteoporosis, so basically mineral deficiencies, okay? And so when the parathyroid gland releases the hormone, parathormone, it pulls more calcium out of the blood, trying to keep the blood levels normal, but they overreact. <laughs> this is very easily resolved, 90 essential nutrients, supplement with more calcium and more vitamin D3. It goes away in a few days. You'll actually gain a couple inches in height because when people have raging osteoporosis, you begin to shrink, okay? And you'll actually regain a lot of that height if you do that. Will you grow taller than you were before? <laughs> it's possible. Really? Ooh. Okay, all right, very good, thank you. And you have seen results from this? I do this thousands of times a year, thousands. Okay. So it has a serious, real yes. track record. Young lady, do you hear that? There's a very real, long-term track record of this treatment for that. Okay? 
I know that. That's why I'm making it really synthetic and clear and succinct. So you get it. There is a whole long track record of this treatment for that. And I'm saying this to build consensus around it. Because you're going to go back to the doctor and he's going to tell you his treatment and you're going to go, oh, yes, doctor. You don't want to, but you're going to be... You're going to be saying it inside yourself. So I'm saying this to you. There is a long-term track record of this working for that. All right? Thank you. Good. Okay, I, I'd like it. to really address that, too. Just give a sneak peek in the back door of this whole situation. Just like Dr. Wallach just described. Let's look at the situation really close. What's happening? Osteoporosis, he just said, is the cause. Now, what happens in osteoporosis is your calcium is not in your bones. Where is it? He just said the blood calcium was really high. Well, some, for some, for some reason, the calcium has left the bone to go to the blood. The question is why? Mm -hmm. Now we can get to the real cause. Why did the calcium leave the bone to get to the blood? And the answer is the body is acid. Why is it acid? Because we made choices unconsciously to bring the acidic levels of our blood way out of whack and so you can go to any store you can get a little ph strip paper and you can start testing your alkalinity and your acid acid acidity well when you bring in the external calcium like he says now you're actually buffering the acids in the blood so that your body doesn't have to rob calcium from the bones so you see neither one is the cause of the other they are ultimately symptoms of unconscious choices now we know what we can do the operating system of the body says we need a certain pH balance. We need to honor that. Absolutely. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to, you know, I want to also say something, picking up on something that Brenda suggested at the very beginning, which is that we look at acidosis as being uh, nutritionally based, having to do with eating certain kinds of foods and drinking certain kinds of waters. And that's true in part. The other part is stress. The other part is emotional balance or imbalance and poor emotional psychological management. Stress causes acidosis, acidification. It's not just food. So in other words, at the end of the day, it can't just be food choices or water choices that you're making. It's much larger than that. This has to do with true human responsibility for your own selves, for all of ourselves on every single level and dimension of our being. It's the way it is. Uh, Brenda, do you wanna... Well, you know, it's true what you just said. Uh, one thing, too, that I think, and I think somebody mentioned it. It may have been you. I'm not really sure. But, you know, that love heals all things. I said love, that. You said that. Guilty as that charged. That love heals all things. <laughs> People actually, we've done this test at the center many times where people are eating all these alkaline foods, and so we actually measure alkalinity and they're alkaline. But then they get mad, exactly. angry. I am talking in a nanosecond, they are acid. Exactly. That quick. Even though before they were alkaline, just a second or two before, but now they're thinking of in this, and you know, anger stores in the liver, fear stores in the kidneys, and there's this emotional component to every disease, and that's why you cannot separate out nutrition from exercise, from cleansing, from thinking, from emotion, and you've got to really treat the whole person, which also is why it's got to be individualized. Because a lot of times people will say, I don't have any emotional issues. I've already worked on all that emotional stuff. I've been going to therapy and so on, and so on, and so on. But they're still ill. And I said, well, you know, if you really had done that and it was really healed, you wouldn't still be exhibiting the physical stuff. And that we've got to look at that. And if, if you can be alkaline because you're eating all these great alkaline things, and then in a moment you can be acidic because of how you're thinking or whatever that emotional thing is that you are feeling, then that tells us something right there, doesn't it? That's why let's say that you're in a situation and you can't find raw food. Let's just say, what if? It's always important to pray and ask for the blessing and a raising of the high vibrational frequency of whatever is going into the body. Because let's face it, 
I prefer eating more raw and living foods, and I eat some cooked vegan foods. But if I were in an environment where it may be dangerous for some reason, let's just say, well, if I ate it, there's some kind of a bacteria, whatever, that could really harm me, then I may say, you know what, that's not going to be safe for me for whatever reason. I'm not going to eat that um, raw. Then praying about it and asking for that blessing, because that also may have actually done um, even pictures of food that have been before and after prayer and to see the energetic vibrational frequencies and feels coming off of them okay so still love does still heal all things now i still believe in eating raw and living foods okay i'm not saying that but i'm saying if there were a case but if i had to make a choice and i could not choose both it's kind of like if you had a choice and you said okay you can choose winning the lotto or you can choose good health. You can't have both. You've got to choose one. All right, so I'd choose health rather than money, even though, gosh, think of all the great things that we can do with the money that we would have. But if I had to choose between, and we were looking at all of these things, whether it be the raw food or the cleansing or the detoxing or the all of it, what will be, if I could only pick one thing, I would pick the emotional healing. Because the emo when the emotional self is healed, the physical body heals. Oh, yeah. if I could only pick one. Yes. That's why I became a psychotherapist. <laughs> I Thank you very much. Uh, Lewis? Thank you. We'll I want to uh, continue the theme that we've gone on. I want to get specific about specificity so we could all walk out of here knowing that it's important to deal with emotions and spiritual and physical, but not know what to do next. So I'd like to give some templates for people that are very specific. So prayer, and people can correct me if they have a different point of view. So prayer means specifically speaking to your internal spirit. And that could be, you know, Jesus, Mohammed, Moses, whatever you like. But it's an internal conversation that you have uh, where you surrender your own self to the life force that's within you. And you ask for guidance to make the right choices in your life through spirit. And that can be people that use pendulums, do, you know, work that way. People who channel work that way. It, it, prayer means many things. And it can mean, oh, oh, God, please let the Yankees win the World Series this year. Uh, or it can mean, oh, Lord, please give me the gift um, to do what I need to do in the situations that arise. No matter what I think is right, uh, please give me the clarity. So that's what a sense of prayer is. Body, there's two ways of working with your body and healing physically, and one is passive and one is active. So passive would be you're in a table and you get Rolf to release your emotional storage, or you get reiki or you get polarity therapy, or Swedish massage, or connective tissue manipulation, or Bowen technique, or a thousand other techniques for emotional release body work. I hope you're not going to name them all. I'm not. <laughs> and the other is movement, um, which things like Tai Chi, yoga, et cetera, et cetera. So integrating passive and active movement. And if you have an imbalance in your system, and you really are sick, things like Feldenkrais and Alexander technique are very, very specific for getting your body uh, in alignment with your emotions and your spiritual element. So um, there are some things that you can work with. And I was actually gonna name 60 or 70 other things, but <laughs> I didn't wanna annoy Mitchell. So um, he might have some emotional issues around me doing <laughs> yes, that. Yes, I probably so, do. So, you know, get specific with this and create, create a discipline in your day that's emotional, biochemical, structural, spiritual. Get mentored, get coached, and be in a psychotherapeutic process so that there's a transition for you every day that's measurable. One thing every mm. day that's transformation in your life, and that'll be 365 things a year, and you'll be constantly in a transformational state and just really evolve to your maximum potential. Beautiful. Which is what we're all looking for, I think, to be the best that we can be. Exactly. Beautiful. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, Chad, you wanted to say anything? Yeah, yeah. I was really thinking about... Um, awesome. Yeah. Yes. I was thinking Thank about uh, the, um, the, the, the nature of thought itself. And this is a scientific experiment. They discovered that when we have a negative thought, the mineral nutrient gates in the very cells contract. Your cells can either be thriving or they could be contracting in protection mode. And so literally... The moment we have a contractive thought based in fear, all the metabolic processes shut down to about one-tenth. 
And so therefore, we're going to obviously see a drop in the alkaline mineral content of the body almost instantly. So there is a bridge between science and spirit, and we're discovering that the moment we get out of stress, the absorption of all of our nutrients goes through the roof up to 10 times. Mm. So they have the FDA, how much of this do you need? The question is, how much do you need, really need on the inside, not how much do you need to put in your mouth to get that? Because mm. absorption is everything. You are not what you eat, you are what you don't excrete. So, <laughs> I mean, so the question is... It depends on what orifice you're looking through. <laughs> so, how, 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 love, love is the ultimate vibration in, this is brainwave research, when they measure the brainwaves of Samadhi and Satori trained monks, the moment they go into that brainwave state, they're describing bliss, pure energy, love, and in that moment, not only do they, um, you know, have these experiences, but they describe the sensation of loss of all hunger. Like a little child lost in what they're loving to do, they're with their imagination, they forget to eat. It's because the body is fed. We have alternate sources of fuel besides calories. Yes, we need all the minerals and nutrients and elements, but they can be compounded and use the energy of the sun. We have 80% of the rods and cones of our eyes, which scientists don't know what they do. And yet, the very technology modeled after is the solar panel. We have built-in solar panels that are able to metabolize sunlight direct to a degree. And this has been measured in the optic nerve, where they measure the electric coming through that fiber. So there's so much about the human experience we don't know, and every challenge has multiple solutions. And there's many ways to get everything that the human metabolism needs, and it's all an exploration. And I invite all of us to just really, like, say yes to the whole thing. It's all good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Chad. It's beautiful. You know, um, along that same line, uh, the HeartMath Institute, if you know it, and if you don't, it's something you're certainly to look into. I interviewed Howard Martin, one of the founders of it, just a few months ago on the radio show. And one of the points that he made so eloquently is that with every time we smile and laugh, there are 1,400 biochemical reactions happening in our blood that help to promote health, happiness, and well-being. So smile. No, 1400s. I mean, that just gives us some small example of how incredibly detailed and profound the human experience is, about which consciously we know so little. So, uh, just to underscore the well made point, Chad, that this is what it's about. This is an exploration of human consciousness. 1400 biochemical reactions are happening in the blood per second when we smile and laugh of a positive sort. I mean, I was just playing paddle tennis this morning before coming here, and I had so many endorphins running through my body that food was the last thing on my mind. I, and I hadn't eaten anything. I was just, I had a little water. And I was just, it was hours later, and I was just like completely full just on the life force itself. So this is what this game is really about. So. I am. We have never had a panel where everybody has gotten along so beautifully, <laughs> and agreed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Somebody wanted to make a comment here, but let's see. We can squish one more question. We got squish. Two. We are going to squish. That's a technical term, folks. Uh, uh, yes. No, no, not you. Uh, you had a chance, and we're two out, out of time. Yes. Lower cholesterol, that raises the question that cholesterol is something that needs to be lowered, right? Yep. So I'll start all with that wait one, yes. in briefly. Briefly, um, if you can find me any disease is caused by elevated blood cholesterol, I'll give you a million bucks. There's not a single disease caused by elevated blood cholesterol, so you don't need to lower it. Lowering cholesterol does nothing, okay? It's kind of dealing with a symptom. It does nothing. The cause of elevated blood cholesterol uh, actually is a result uh, secondarily of diabetes, secondarily of uh, hypothyroidism or pre-goiter deficiencies or, or ratio problems between omega-3, 6s, and 9s, um, deficiencies of chromium vanadium, two trace minerals are involved with blood sugar and blood fat levels, and also deficiencies of niacin. Those things elevate cholesterol. Cholesterol does not cause any disease. Okay, so you do not need to lower cholesterol. You want to find out what's causing it to be elevated, then deal with that. The cholesterol comes down in the normal range. The normal range for human beings is 220 to 270. If you have happy cholesterol without drugs down below 
200, 180, 160, 140, 90, you're in trouble because you cannot make adrenal hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, because those are all steroid hormones. You require cholesterol as raw materials to make them. You do not want to get your blood cholesterol uh, below 200. Otherwise, you're going to need Enzite and Bob, you know. Guy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I agree with everything he said. <laughs> he seconds it. <laughs> Right on. Well, um, so I like to look at cholesterol like Teflon on your pan. You know, why is it there? It's so things don't stick. Why and where does the cholesterol congregate on the inside of the blood vessels? Why? Because the blood is so acid, it's eating through the veins. And that would kill you, so your body's got to do something. And it says, hey, cholesterol is an insulator. We'll pack that on there and, like, patch up the little veins and stuff. And that's why it's doing that. So what happens if we get alkaline, get that acids out? All of a sudden, we're... We don't have to even ask these questions anymore. Beautiful. beautiful. Just briefly, very briefly, um, when you look at cholesterol in the blocked arteries as the cause of blocked arteries, it's like looking at wood ash as the cause of forest fires. <laughs> Every time there's wood ashes, there's a forest fire, so the forest fire must be caused by the wood ashes, right? So because there's cholesterol in the plugged arteries, it must be the cause of plugged arteries. No, no, it's just there sort of serendipitously. It's not the cause. It's an effect. Exactly. Brenda, did you want to say a word about? Well, I think uh, all that is 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 right on, and still we're okay. going back to that acidity, alkalinity, you know, yes. issue, and which I thought that you put brilliantly. I do know though that we only have a few more minutes, don't we? Yes. And so we're probably got to wrap it up now, right? Something like that. I think so. <laughs> I think we need to wrap it up because I saw her little sign. Um, this has been a great panel, really, really great and wonderful information, and it's wonderful to have a panel so that you can listen and explore on your journey as you're learning, so that you can, uh, n nobody, I will say this for myself, I'm not up here trying to get you to think the way I think. I want to get you thinking, because once you're thinking for yourself, you're going to want more information and you begin to investigate. You can make better s decisions for yourself. Um, I am going to be on, I'm going to be speaking one more time tomorrow. I know we're going to tell about that, right? Everybody's going to tell. So I'll be speaking tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock, and I'll be in this room here, the Gramercy Room. I've got a booth, and I'm on the mezzanine level. I'm overlooking the lobby of the hotel. Uh, I've got some scholarships for people who want to come to my program in Atlanta and learn hands-on. Please come and see us, because we'll help you. Don't let money stand in the way. And I also have a $95 package for 30 which is going to include a book with recipes, two DVDs and a CD. So people that are ready to start learning at home and they're ready to start trying at home, you know, getting started, this is a really, really great way for you to get started. Main thing is just get started somewhere. Do something good for yourself. You'll get something good back. Thank you. Now before we move right much. along, I began to think that you were the moderator and I should be a panelist. <laughs> but I want to just first, uh, pick up on this cholesterol question, and then we'll do, everybody will say when you're doing everything in your websites and whatever the heck you want. That's fine. But this is a really important question that this young lady asked about cholesterol because it highlights not only good, really sound answers, but because it shows how propagandized we have been as a society by the medical associations who believe, they have not proven, they believe certain ideas and you can follow a money trail behind certain ideas like the cholesterol question, like the low fat question, like the diabetes question and on and on and on. And that is something that we all need to really get a very aware of because we're being propagandized, we're being brainwashed. And if you believe then your doctor, then that means you're actually worshiping at a church of some sort. This is supposed to be science, man. You see what I mean? So, anyway, I just want to bring that idea out. This is not a belief system. This is supposed to be medicine. And if it is, if you're being led along a path of belief by your doctor, stand back and take another look, okay? Anyway, that said, Chad. All right, Chad Ashley Vandenberg. I'm going to be talking here tomorrow night at 5 o'clock, and it's superhuman body, mind, and mood, how to achieve it. We're going to be talking about how to get all the elements, including rare elements that affect the genetics of our body. 
and we're going to talk about simple practices we can do to eliminate stress and bring that bliss vibration into our body so that we can have the nutritional benefits of that as Beautiful. well. Beautiful. Dr. Wallach. Okay, Dr. Joel Wallach, uh, I will be speaking tomorrow afternoon. I apologize, I don't have a program, so I don't know what time you have to look on the program. Um, just let's keep quiet for just two yeah. more minutes. Two more minutes. Um, and if you're gonna be a vegan, we want you to flourish, and so come on down and look at our certified organic plant-derived colloidal minerals. These are extracted from plants, certified organic, 77 minerals. How good does it get if you're a vegan? Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Lewis Harrison, aside from everything else I do, I am an entrepreneur and a bi- All right, quiet, 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 please, please, please. Thank you, no fan clubs here today. I, um, I am a capitalist, a successful capitalist entrepreneur, and one of the fastest growing industries in America right now is greening, and so I am a partner in the largest manufacturer of green products in the world. And it's not a Do you have a website? Do you have a talk you're giving? Go, I'm talking tomorrow at 4 o'clock on how to create wealth through the green industries. Okay. And there is a website to see how much crap you have in your house that's killing you called HealByGoingGreen.com. It's a free test that will freak you out for sure. And then you can contact me through that if you like. And um, I have, of course, this book available, 30-Day Body Purification Program. And I'm on the mezzanine. I have a booth on the mezzanine, the second thank floor. You, Lewis. Thank you so much. Four and, o'clock uh, tomorrow. I want to just thank you all. I also want to just tell you to tune in to the radio show if you're interested in more information like this. We cover it every Monday and every Wednesday at 6 p.m. on Progressive Radio Network, Gary Knoll's uh, radio sh uh, station. And if you go to a betterworld.net, I spoke last night. I'm sorry many of you missed it. But the people who were there were very happy. But abetterworld.net, come visit, join our newsletter. We reach lots of people with lots of good information every week. So thanks so much for being a wonderful audience and panel. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Brenda, thank you.